and forgiveness as a as part of our lives. Um, how can we make forgiving a part of our daily life? Okay, again, I address that in the book, The Forgiving Life. And if you hear the title of that, it's saying forgiveness is part of you. See, Aristotle said this, the more you practice a moral virtue, the more you end up liking it because you see that it, the goodness flowing out really leads to uh, really an enrichment of your, of your humanity. So the more you practice it, the more you begin to like it. He said, eventually the maturation in any moral virtue, in this case, forgiveness, is to develop a love of the virtue. Where you say, look, when I forgive, I am not letting others have power over me. I'm not letting the toxicity that that person put in my heart live with me forever. Hey, I'm like, not just liking this, I love it so much that it has become a part of me. And once that's the case, Forgiveness literally can become part of your identity. It's part of who you are as a person, where people can literally say, you know, I'm a forgiving person. And when I don't forgive, that's pretty much going against my own standards. It's going against what I value. And so you then end up with an obligation to yourself, where at first you're freely choosing to forgive sometimes not others, it depends on your mood and your energy or other things. The more you walk that path and you mature in forgiveness, you want it to be part of your life. It becomes part of who you are. And every time people offend you in a way that's somewhat serious, forgiveness becomes a part of your healthy way of responding, the forgiving life. And Robert, I feel like when we and make forgiveness a part of our daily life, we just live lighter and freer and more connected. That's right. Well, think of the men in the maximum security correctional institution who went from clinical anger, anxiety, and depression to normal levels. They're lighter, okay? Uh, we worked in, uh, I helped supervise uh, a researcher, a graduate student in Pakistan, she did a study of acid burn victims, women, okay, acid where they were disfigured in their face. And when they ended up, and they freely chose to forgive, no one forced them, they ended up with more hope for the future, where they realized that they can make it with what has happened to them that should never have happened to them. And so they got hope out of the forgiveness program. And I found that really, really encouraging to see that hope in the face of something brutal that should have never happened to them. And every time they look in the mirror, they have a reminder of what happened to them. They had more hope. You know, some of your latest endeavors include forgiveness education outside the U.S., even internationally, places like Israel, Monrovia, Northern Ireland, and the Philippines, where I happen to be from. Yeah. And, and Taiwan as well. Tell me about that. Okay. Well, I was a slow learner because I started studying forgiveness in 1985. And only at the turn of this century, it dawned on me, hey, if people who are 35 years old and they've been hurt very gravely for the first time and don't know how to make their way to forgiveness, and that did actually happen. A 35-year-old woman came to me and she said, my husband abandoned me. I have two children. I now have to get a job and I want to forgive him, but I don't know how. And so I said to myself, what if she knew how to forgive when this happened to her? She'd be in a much better state right now because yes, she has to raise her children, get a job, and she has lack of energy, but she would have grown in this moral virtue of forgiving. So I said at the turn of the century, around the year 2001, especially 2002, what if we started bringing forgiveness curricula to children as young as age four, five, or six, where we don't ask them necessarily to forgive, but we let them learn about forgiveness through stories. So they say, oh, yes, it happens when you're treated unjustly. 
because I see story characters treated unjustly and you offer goodness as best you can and it's a struggle. Oh, and look, and sometimes they even reconcile in these stories and offer love to one another. They're beginning at a very young age to start developing a sense of what forgiveness is, liking it if they so choose so, and to even practice it to some degree without pressure to do so. It's not therapy, it's education. And so we started building curricula with stories, just pictures, picture books with young children about love and about conflict and conflict resolution. And our first port of call was Northern Ireland. And it's because remember, it wasn't until 1998 that they signed what they called the Good Friday Peace Agreement. So we came for only four years after that. And they were still settling down from that. There were still British soldiers on street corners with their large rifles and the like. And their police cars were st still had a lot of camouflage on them because of attacks and the like. And so it was still a somewhat dangerous place to be. And we went into principal's offices and we said, what would you think of helping children in this war-torn area, because they just had gone through the troubles, learn about forgiveness so they can practice it within their own families. They can learn about it in school and practice it when troubles come up on the playground, if they wish. But it's really learning about it. And a lot of the principals were eager. They said, you know, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, and we were saying, we're not going to bring the Irish and English together because they, were, they have separate schools, by the way, uh, or the Catholics and the Protestants. Uh, we're going to leave it within the community, within their own community, within the storybooks, and let them grow into forgiveness where eventually they might want to bring this idea of forgiveness between groups in different neighborhoods because they had very segregated neighborhoods, but not now. Let them learn about it. And then if they wish, as they grow older, bring people together for community healing. And so we did a study with uh, six-year-olds. And by the way, when we gave them anger scales, on the average, these six-year-olds on the average were very close to clinical levels of anger already. These little children, hardly in the world at all, had such a difficult environment that a clinical psychologist looking at an average child's anger proto, uh, profile would be concerned. And so we brought them through a forgiveness curriculum about 17 weeks. And we had a control group who didn't have it. And not surprisingly, their anger went down. When they were learning about forgiveness through stories, with just a little bit of practice, they ended up obviously applying it to themselves because they ended up forgiving those who hurt them and their anger levels went down. We thought, you know, we're on to something here. And just here's one story. I was walking on a playground, a school playground with one of the principals and we were talking about the program and there were two little boys on the ground fighting, hitting each other. And he said to me, watch this. And he and I both walked over and he said, you two lads, stand up. And in Northern Ireland, when a principal says that, students do that. And so they stood up and he said, are you two lads part of the forgiveness program? And without saying anything, they looked at each other, their eyes brightened, they smiled, they shook hands, and they ran off. And to use an Irish expression, the principal said to me, they ran off as happy as Larry. And he said, it's made my job as a disciplinarian easier now that we have forgiveness education in the schools. So we've spread this out and we just got done with a grant where we did forgiveness education at Agape Love combined in Israel and Northern Ireland and Taiwan with good results. Can you give us some of those results? Yeah, well, they ended up learning about Agape Love and appreciating agape and the idea that they can appropriate agape love even in school. And they 
one of the issues of feedback from the students in this uh, was adolescence, and they said, well, you know, we cooperate better now. We have the sense that, you know, we don't have to hate others and just stay angry with them when we're not getting along. We can offer them what Thomas Aquinas called charity, and there, therefore there's more of a glue that keeps them together. And the teachers said the same thing, and the teachers who taught the program ended up forgiving those who've hurt them. And that wasn't even, you know, part of our goal where the teachers should deliberately forgive. We just said teach, and they applied it to themselves and began to forgive others who've hurt them. So they appropriated the teaching with the students into their own heart. And does it really matter if we're teaching forgiveness in Monrovia uh, versus Iceland? I I is it really all the same because we're all humans? Right. And as Aristotle says, there is an essence to what forgiveness is that does not change across culture. What changes across culture is how we forgive or what stories we choose. And so we're not all going to use the same stories like Dr. Seuss's Horton Hears a Who, where he saves the little who's and the jungle animals were very cruel to them. Well, we might use other stories. In Greece, for example, where uh, Peli Galiti, G-A-L-I-T-I, has been for a number of years, she and I worked together, they use Homer, and they use the Iliad, or they use uh, folk tales from Greece, you see. And they don't use the American versions of stories. They use their own, which is very rich tradition. So there are differences in terms of what stories we use. But ultimately, forgiveness is about being a moral virtue when you're treated unjustly. You get rid of the negatives, negative thoughts, feelings, and behaviors toward the one who hurt you. And you offer positive thoughts, feelings, and behaviors toward the one who hurt you, regardless of whether it's the Philippines or Athens or Monrovia. But how we choose to do it and think about it with the different stories is different. And that enriches the cultural aspects with the same view of what forgiveness is, the same pathway. What advice would you give parents regarding forgiveness and not only in modeling forgiveness, which means that they would have to work on themselves, but also how to teach it to their kids, whether they're young, uh, middle schoolers or high schoolers, or even grown adults? I would say use teachable moments if you're watching a film together or watching some kind of a program on television, when there's conflict in the this program, ask, what would have happened if they solved this differently? What would have happened if they stopped and took the time to try to train their minds and hearts to see the humanity in the other, to see what we call the built-in worth of the other, the inherent worth of the other? And they started softening their heart toward the other while still asking for fairness, but with a softened heart and deliberately trying to see the humanity in the other, how might the story have ended differently? So you're using that teachable moment. Use teachable moments at the dinner table. If you're sitting around and you're one of the adults, you might say, well, I had a difficult day today. Okay, when I got off the bus, uh, there was this car that really came too close to me. And that scared me and that bothered me because that person wasn't really taking me into account. But I'm not going to just simply dwell on that person and see that person as less than human. I'm going to try to see who this person is. And maybe, you know, the person was distracted or was having a bad day. And I don't want to make something up, but maybe this person just needs a little bit more training in, we have a, an expression in our International Forgiveness Institute, driving for others' lives. And maybe if that person can do that, the, the traffic flow would be more peaceful. So I'm going to try and forgive this person. You see, the children, while they're eating their food, has seen the parent 
model, again, a teachable moment that was real. Or you could say, how about in school today? Were there any conflicts that you saw or experienced? And bring the idea of forgiveness in. Can you see the humanity in the ones who hurt you? Or can all you see is that bad behavior? And I would challenge you children to expand your vision and to see the person more broadly as someone who is imperfect, who sometimes can fall down, might be wounded, and is a human being. And how are you and I to respond to human beings even when they behave badly? And that might take you know, 500 times, but you use the teachable moments and even say, you know, well, when I forgave, what I'm doing is trying to get rid of this negativity in me. And I'm trying to offer the gift of goodness toward this person. And it's not justice I'm offering, it's mercy, it's love. And if the person keeps being mean to me, I'm going to try for fairness with the justice issue as a moral virtue together. And I'm not going to be walked on. I'm not going to forgive and let people take advantage of me. But it sure might cleanse my heart and lead to a better relationship. If the children hear that hundreds of times, if they are now the 35-year-old whose uh, husband abandons this person, will they be more ready to handle it? I say yes.